Major concern, and I am from a CA profession. That's why this question, you know, comes to my mind because whenever we go to any industry, we find that there is one organized sector and there are hundred unorganized, unorganized companies. And organized sector has to compete with unorganized, which is not, you know, uh, paying customs and excise and other things. Yep. So that is a question, you know, which comes to my mind. I should be asking to you, to all of you, as you know, anybody good. So, so if, if, like. if I heard the question correctly, it is, how do we encourage the growth of the organized sector? Is that Correct. No. How to join an unorganized sector to get overall, uh, I should say, efficiencies in Indian context. Okay. Any takers? Uh, I have one one answer to it. I don't think the unorganized sector wants to improve. It it is in an inefficient equilibrium, and everybody is happy with that. Uh, and that's my sense of, I mean, the guy doesn't want to pay taxes. He's happy with the money he makes. The moment he pays taxes, he'll have to work harder. And there is an interesting study Kumar was telling. It's a, it's a very nice story. I won't reveal the entire story of it. There is this, can I? Yeah, okay. <laughs> so there, there is this person who didn't pay taxes for many, many years, okay? And showed that, and actually showed the sales was 40 or 50% of the real sales to dodge all taxes. As a consequence, over after 10 years, the bank refused to give this person money because saying you're not profitable. Now, really the person was profitable, but he was happily siphoning off the money on the side. So his cost of borrowing went up after 10 years with the bank's refused to lend, which may be the reason why 50% of the SMEs don't get any loans in the country, okay? So then they, the Deloitte people sat with him and said, if you had been honest for 10 years and paid taxes, you would have got cheaper loans, and therefore you would have been more profitable if you had remained honest. Now the, the, the problem really is you're trading off immediate gains due to dishonesty with long run gains due to being reasonably honest. And I don't know what the answer is. I, I hope Kumar has better answers well, than Well, I. we only always encourage honesty. <laughs> well, maybe the, the solution is to do what they do in China, which is to have two sets of books. <laughs> Who said so? <laughs> other, other questions from the audience? Good evening, sir. Oh, here. Uh, I am, uh, yeah, here. Okay. Yeah. Yep. Uh, I uh, I am a current student here. Uh, I come from a, a family business background. We are into precision manufacturing of tools for automotive, mainly for automotive industry. Uh, we talked about uh, there is a demand and uh, we have exhausted uh, the supply. Uh, Mr. Sridhar talked about it. And uh, uh, what problem we which we are facing in our uh, industry is that uh, the confidence of uh, the European uh, uh, manufacturers in the Indian capabilities. The brand India is not, uh, uh, there is no confidence in brand India. They think that we can't, we can probably do a low end work, but precision engineering manufacturing is probably not India's work, uh, is what they think. So we would have, uh, typically for us, selling means a one year uh, uh, period in which we try to build confidence, uh, supplying parts uh, almost free or as a sample, and then slowly we get into it. So uh, we have built a lot of capacity, but we are not able to utilize the capacity here in, India, uh, in our factory. So how do we uh, build brand India? How do we do it quickly? Brand India versus brand China? Do you want to take that? Mm -hmm. or? I'll, all right, I'll try. Um, that's a tough one. I, I, um, I, well, getting back to the comparison with China, one of the advantages that China had was that a lot of their growth in manufacturing was simply a shifting of capacity from places like Hong Kong and Taiwan, which were already established. Um, and they haven't had a lot of growth. They had, they've had some, but not as much growth of indigenous uh, manufacturing. So that is more challenging to do. Um, and I think it requires going on sales missions to other countries and, and making connections with customers. Um, 
I, I wonder to what extent there is a global network of ethnic Indians that, that could be tapped into. After all, there are a lot of very successful Indians in the UK, in the US, in Australia, in Southeast Asia, in East Africa, in South Africa, in the West Indies. I mean, they're, they're all over the place, and many of them are very successful. Uh, I think, I mean, just as the experience of the Chinese has involved those types of ethnic uh, networks, uh, maybe there's an opportunity there uh, to, to start the process of developing customers and then build from there. That's just one thought. I don't know. Thank, thank you. I think that was an excellent answer. And in some of the interviews that we did, which uh, Sridhar alluded to earlier and Peter talked about, in some sectors, what we were beginning to hear is people like China for high volume, low engineering manufacture, and in other things which required more engineering, which were smaller volume things, they liked India. For example, fire retardant clothing that required quite a lot of chemical or chemical engineering uh, expertise. So it's, it's not clear that it is one or the other, that uh, they, uh, uh, they would pass on something uh, like precision tools. But I think Iris' point about um, uh, leveraging the Indian diaspora as well as really establishing uh, customer relationships on a personal level is a very critical uh, uh, what may be a very critical strategy uh, for your company or companies like yourself to take. And I'm reminded of a story uh, that I encountered earlier this year. Uh, probably the second largest manufacturer of um, uh, the uh, microphone that is used in a telephone handset. And it used to be, uh, you know, sort of a European uh, manufacturer uh, that dominated that space. And now a Chinese manufacturer has incredible uh, market share. And, and it had to do with the fact that they were very persistent and they worked on building the relationships over an extended period of time and building the trust. Uh, in their product uh, with the customer. In fact, the entrepreneur's son went off, you know, and literally camped outside Motorola till he got the engineers to engage with the product. And, and then after that, uh, they got venture capital that began to help them further uh, uh, further at uh, the, the sales process because the VCs became a source of uh, potential relationships. So how you capitalize and how you build those personal relationships I think are, are probably very critical in when, when you don't have brand recognition early on. And you know that's just an anecdotal answer. Can I add a little bit to that? I, I'm thinking about IT services industry. And actually, again, in comparison, when I went to Russia and to other countries in Eastern Europe, they're all saying, you know, how did uh, IT services industry build a brand in there that's now so powerful, and how can we do that? And in their mind of the competition, at least, you know, a lot of it, so it, it's the factors that were already mentioned, like onshore presence that helps face-to-face -face relationship building, uh, obviously language that helps as well but there are two other factors and one is the industry associations they believe that NASCOM has done wonders for the Indian industry in IT services and that they do not you know have such a strong association and so I, I perhaps I'm not quite sure what are the activities of industry associations here uh, in manufacturing but that's a question to ask you know as is the industry working are the industry representatives working together in that regard, because that's the key. They would be the one tapping into industry reports, you know, influencing Deloitte of this world to write good things. And the second thing in terms is that, that Russia, again, this coming from Eastern Europe, that they believe made the Indian case so strong in IT, was the, str the strengths of the sales people. In fact, the fact that many of you here are getting MBAs and uh, people, you know, the number of Indians who have gotten MBAs from top business schools in the U.S is very impressive. So leveraging those perhaps in manufacturing as well as they've been leveraged in IT. 
I, I think that's also an excellent answer because in, in one sense, uh, NASCOM has done a terrific job of Brand India. And as we talked earlier about how this whole conference originated, it originated because Sridhar and I had this conversation about the number of Deming Awards that India had, and I was surprised. That's not a story that is well known outside of perhaps this room. Uh, and whenever I mention it to colleagues in America, they're kind of stunned, right? And so somewhere, you know, there has been a failure to communicate the wins and the stories of success of Indian manufacturing into a global uh, marketplace. Of course, you know, the Tata story is interesting and so forth, but it has not been done in a collective and sustained way. So I think um, a trade association that focuses on that could, could really advance the cause. And I hope this conference and this kind of activity begins to advance the cause too. Yeah, uh, this is Dr. Gajaveli VS with IMT. Okay. Uh, uh, sirs and ma'am, uh, I think this question is to the entire panel. And uh, the question is uh, uh, very much uh, particular with respect to the Indian context. And uh, the context is the kind of uh, growth strategy as adopted by the Indian government and industry. The question is, I am looking at uh, the sectoral contributions and uh, the workforce allocation across agriculture, industry, and services. I think the track record shows that the India leapfrog directly from agriculture to that of services. And people say it is a distorted development. So my question is, from the point of view of this particular uh, uh, major distortion that has taken place with respect to only in the Indian context, not in really in comparison with uh, advanced nations or our immediate neighbor China. So what are its long-term implications to Indian uh, industry's growth and its sustainability? Hmm. Would you be able to? Uh, I'll take a, a crack. Um, well, it's, it's true. It's been an unusual um, development path, uh, but it's, it's because of some unusual circumstances. A, a large pool of um, low-cost, highly skilled labor uh, and a new type of service that can be exported via satellite. Um, and I think that will continue to grow. But as has been said here, um, if we're going to witness India shift a very large share of the population out of poverty and into the middle class, out of rural agriculture and into urban um, business, it's going to have to involve more than IT services. Um, and it will probably have to involve uh, low wage, low skill manufacturing. So uh, although this path has, has worked to help propel strong economic growth here, it's not sufficient to keep India going, and that's why manufacturing is so important. I'd, I'd like to add one other thing to the discussion from before about ways to build a manufacturing base. I think the last speaker was correct in that retailing could play a critical role, uh, because if, if big retailers are allowed to develop here, like Walmart and Carrefour and Metro and others, they will stimulate the development of more centralized modern manufacturing, and they will help in the takeoff process for manufacturers, because they will they will necessarily create a supply chain and and have strong demands of highly efficient domestic suppliers for their supply chain within India, but more importantly, for their global supply chain. Walmart, the world's largest retailer, last year purchased $18 billion worth of goods in China. And they have their global sourcing headquarters in China. And they have, in the process, stimulated a lot of manufacturing development in southern China. They would like, and they have said, they would like to dramatically expand their sourcing in India. And right now, it runs at about a billion and a half dollars a year. And they want to increase that dramatically. And they also want to build stores here and integrate the two supply chains. If they are able to do that, if they're permitted to do that, that alone could play a significant role in stimulating manufacturing development. And it may have a secondary effect of stimulating reform in some of the farming and agricultural. Oh, right, sector. exactly. Yeah. As a fallout effect. Yeah. Thank you. Well, I think we're at the end of our time, right? So I want to thank all the panelists and uh, all of you for your uh, participation uh, in this panel and throughout the day. Thank you. And we hope we can do this again.
in the future. Yeah. At this point, I would like to thank all the panelists, all the speakers of this conference, and all of you for actually staying here for right through the end. I personally enjoyed both these days. I mean, I learned a lot. And as a young researcher in the field, I think there are lots of opportunities. I mean, me for an academician, but even for you guys who are from the industry, to take a look at all the problems and the opportunities and do something about it. So with this, I would like to present the panelists with mementos so that they can remember this first conference of ours. Yeah, Trilochan Shastri. <laughs> Natalia Levine. Ira Kalish and Ajit Kambal. And Sridhar already got his, so. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you all, Adai. Thank you.